Imagine you're embarking on a path towards a personal goal. Let's say an athletic achievement, an academic pursuit, a career. Along the way, you hear words of encouragement from people who have achieved the same goal before you. You hear voices telling you how they did it, how you can do it, how amazing the end result is going to be. Take a moment, listen to these voices. Can you hear encouragement? Surely someone is on the path ahead of you. Now imagine if that silence was actually a true reflection of the support, advice, inspiration that you actually received. How would you feel? That profound silence can be all you hear when you are the first to do something. And it happens more than we think. As a society in Canada, I don't think we acknowledge this silence enough, these absent voices on chosen paths. You can't, it, this absence of voices, it's amazing when you think about it. It's just quiet silence. How awkward did that silence make you feel? Can you imagine if it was measured in, not in seconds, but in years, decades, lifetimes, because no one had done it before? I can still remember the moment when I began to understand the importance of this silence. It was actually the day after I graduated from medical school before. So it was the morning after, no alarm set, no exam scheduled to panic about. I was resting comfortably on the sun deck, and the phone rang. Is Nadine Carone there? Speaking. Hi, Dr. Carone. My heart skipped a beat. It seemed unreal, impossible. It was the first time in my life anyone had addressed me as doctor. The president would like to speak to you, said the voice on the phone, referring to the president of the university I had just graduated from 18 hours earlier. I didn't know what to think. I'd never graduated from medical school before. I didn't know the protocols. And then I thought, oh, maybe he's calling everyone in our class, and he's just calling me first in the morning because he's doing it in alphabetical order, and my last name starts with a C. His voice boomed confidently through the receiver. Congratulations was his message. Thank you, sir, but do you mind if I ask, why are you calling me? Well, you're our first female First Nations student to graduate from our university's School of Medicine. We are so proud. He sounded genuine, truly sincere. Yet I was oscillating between the polite Canadian thank you and the question that was tumbling around in my mind. Thank you, sir, but it's 1997. Is me being the first really something to be proud of? I began to understand the misconception about being first. It became evident that being first is something that's often automatically considered something positive, special, something to celebrate. Like, on your mark, get set, go. Everyone starts the same race at the same time with the same rules. We all realize it would feel amazing to cross the finish line first, and somebody always does. Then there's the understated first, like a huge community event. Everyone hungry, so many people waiting to eat at the buffet. They call your table number, you get to go to the buffet first. <laughs> it's amazing, and think about it. Admit it, big or small, we all can think of moments when being first was simply something to celebrate. But there are times when being first is filling a void more than achieving a goal. When we strip away the words that make first sound so positive, we may actually unveil major crevices in our country's history. What does history hide in our closets as a country, as an academic academy, as a medical profession that kept the generations before me from even having the opportunity to break that barrier the president had called me about? 
What social or educational barriers exist did me being the first actually reveal? The day I received my medical degree, it was a watershed day in my life, a day to celebrate the achievements of those in our graduating class, and a day to start examining the failures of the country in which we had done it. The fact that no female First Nations student had done so before me had absolutely nothing to do with me. The relative void of Aboriginal or Indigenous physicians in this country, back then it wasn't my fault, but overnight it became part of who I was. It's amazing, like years later, when I'm standing by the stage for an invited lecture, a keynote address, a TEDx talk, these are words that I hear when I'm being introduced. The first female First Nations student to graduate from her university's medical school. The first female First Nations general surgeon in Canada. The first this, the first that. They may sound like badges of honor, but these are often pinned on suits owned by people who are cautious to wear them because the word first is readily used with little reflection for what it might signify not far below the surface. I have had the honor of learning from children along the way who have been so courageous to teach me about the distance, the chasm between their world and the world I was in with MD after my name, the world I was resting comfortably in the morning of that phone call. When I was in medical school, I started going out to First Nation communities so that I could talk to high school and elementary school students about what it was like to go to university, to be in medical school, to study the human body, what it was like to pursue a dream. How I would do so would bring part of the medical school with me. The shock factor works great with kids. So I would bring specimens from the pathology lab so I could actually show them what a human lung looked like and then show them what a human lung looked like from someone who smoked. I wouldn't say, don't smoke. I would let them come to their own conclusions. And then I'd show them a specimen of a human brain with an epidural hematoma. That's a blood clot on the brain, often caused by trauma, in this case, from an individual who had fallen off their bike. I don't say, wear your helmet when you're skateboarding. I let them come to their own conclusions. Then maybe pass around a human skeleton, something they could see but also touch and feel. And I explain how the tendons attach the muscles to the bone to make movement possible so that they can run, jump, throw. And every time you can feel fascination in the classroom, you can see joy in their eyes, a sense of wonder, the aha moment. Learning at university could be fun. Years after that phone call I told you about, I was visiting an elementary school in a remote First Nations community. It was the end of the first of a two-day visit, and I was carrying those boxes of specimens from the classroom to my car, back and forth, back and forth. There were two young girls sitting in front of the school, and I can remember them like it was yesterday. What they looked like, what they were wearing, they were arguing about something, and I couldn't quite hear what it was about. But boy, were they arguing. And every single time I passed, that argument seemed to escalate, until finally, I thought, I better interrupt here, or a fight's going to break out. Hey, girls, can you please help me bring these boxes to my car? They both stopped talking, looked up from where they were sitting, and the younger of the two broke into this huge smile. It turns out she was in the grade three class I had talked to that afternoon. The older student beside her was her sister. In the grade four class, I was scheduled to talk to the following day. You're the Indian doctor that came to talk to my class today, right? Said the younger one, really excited. Yes, I am, I said, smiling at her. See, she turned triumphantly to her older sister. I told you Indians could be doctors. I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. Laugh or cry? Laugh, certainly, because that look of joy in that younger girl's eyes to actually win an argument with her older sister was priceless. Or cry. 
when I think about how adamant, how sure that older sister was that her younger sister must be crazy to think that any Indian anywhere could actually be a doctor. At the age of nine or ten, that older sister was so sure of her limitations. At that age, when children are asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? And they answer, astronaut, professional hockey player, teacher, doctor, lawyer, prime minister. Everyone around them should be nodding their heads and saying, you'll be a great prime minister one day. What had happened in her short life to date that made her see doors that were closed before even knowing where they led to? How can any child have such limits? But I've been to too many communities and met too many children who see it this way. Perhaps they need to see someone up close, really up close, someone who has defied the limits that they have actually believed in and set in their mind. They need to hear that it has been done before by someone exactly like them. And that message, it can come from the first, and it would be powerful, I suppose. But what if the first hasn't happened yet? What if there is no first? What if that child chooses a path on which there are no voices? These chasms that can absolutely crush ambition, they're not limited to children in elementary schools. They just sadly start there and set the foundation for a broad spectrum of societal gaps. You would be surprised at the long list of firsts that remain unfilled, waiting for our Indigenous youth to step into. Even at a national level, it's amazing when you think about it, for a country that is searching for justice for its first peoples, what will it signify when we finally have our first Indigenous justice in the Supreme Court of Canada? Something way more complex, far from simple, it's interesting. Has anyone here ever considered why we've never had an Indigenous Minister of Indigenous Affairs? It, you can think about it, for, just look at it from the rest of Canada. What about non-Indigenous Canadians? Do they feel these kind of voids that Indigenous Canadians so often feel? Well, we've got a vast country. We claim all this diversity. We have never had a non-Caucasian prime minister. Apply that same statement to the main federal political parties. To my knowledge, none have had a non-Caucasian leader. <coughs> Technically speaking, we haven't even had that choice on the ballot. Put politics aside for a second. What about the media? The media, which impacts the topics of our conversation, influences how we see our country on a global scale. We all have our media outlets of choice. My favorite newspaper is the Globe and Mail. I know I'm not alone because it's Canada's most read newspaper. Less known is the fact that it was established in 1936, after the merger of the Globe, which was established in 1844, and the Mail and Empire, which was founded in 1895. Neither its predecessors nor the Globe and Mail itself have ever had a female editor-in-chief. We're still waiting. Still waiting. But when these voids are filled, and they will be, and countless others, and we automatically cheer for the individual who does so, when will we start to openly discuss and automatically start thinking and considering why was there never anyone before? I think we need to redefine, re-explore what we celebrate when we combine an individual's achievement with our country's history. We should celebrate the first, the individual, for achieving their goal, definitely. For their commitment, for their skill, for the quality of their work, not just the void they fill. We should recognize that void and the impact when that void is filled and celebrate that step in the right direction. We should, but we should also recognize that when that first occurs, when they achieve their goal, when they win, the audience that gives that standing ovation, 
eventually goes home and a new burden is left in its place. What burden? The burden I began to feel the morning of that phone call. Now that's not a burden really, it's a responsibility and a big relief when I realize, heck, it is way bigger than one person. It is responsibility for us as a society to never, ever confuse the first, the person we're celebrating, with the only. May I propose that true success comes at a much less obvious time, perhaps anticlimactic, but nonetheless a fundamentally vital moment, when the first, in whatever field, for whatever void, becomes simply one of the many. And by saying that, we're saying it's not one person, it's not one group, it's all of us. We need Indigenous and non-Indigenous Canadians to address the cultural issues. We need men and women to address the class ceiling. It's like a sporting event. The players on the court directly benefit from those who care about the outcome. Spectators are an integral part of home court advantage. And a stadium is never silent when it is filled with fans. True impact is not about the first. It's about the populace that follows them. Imagine the first walking through a grass field in order to get to their destination, their goal. When they walk through, the grass just springs back up behind them, leaving an impact on that grass field about as long as the media story about them. There is no path. But when a few people follow that first, that grass is partially compressed. There's a suggestion of a trail, hopefully long enough for the next individual to actually find it and realize that the desired destination is indeed possible. But when the first actually moves from being the only to one of the many, that grass is trampled. It is a permanent path and it is worth going down. And when one of the many one day go into a grade four classroom and they go in to inspire these kids, it will have not even dawned on those children to have altered their course because of perceived limitations. That is something to celebrate. We, today, we can change that deafening silence into sound. We can change those absent voices into cheers. And our future first, they will cause us to pause they will force us to, to decipher what do we celebrate, make us decide what our next steps are, and fundamentally come to our own conclusions. Thank you. Chi miigwech.